uh, appreciate the support uh, uh, for this and, and all the other things we do in, in air and missile defense. So what changed? Well, the bottom line is, is the world did. Um, the last uh, proper air and missile defense strategy was written in 2012, uh, published, and it was right for the time then. Uh, the United States was embroiled in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and the, the perceived threats uh, that we had on the horizon were really uh, the rogue nation states um, and, and terrorist organizations. Uh, and so we started taking uh, the air and missile defense community in that direction. We did an update to that strategy in, in 2015 uh, called Waypoint One, uh, which helped uh, continue the effort for some of the programs of record that we were working uh, in order to make sure that they, they maintain good funding in the palms and things like that. Then uh, we got a new national defense strategy, a new national military strategy. Uh, we had a change in the, in the operating environment uh, that we find ourselves in uh, with the, uh, the reemergence of, of near peer competitors uh, and in many cases peer competitors uh, that can challenge us in multiple uh, domains uh, and in some cases multiple domains simultaneously. Uh, advances in uh, threat technology, uh, things like hypersonics, uh, swarming drones, um, much more accurate uh, ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, we found ourselves in a position that we needed to communicate to the force, uh, both the Air and Missile Defense Force and the Army, uh, and truthfully the joint community, uh, that we were going in a different direction to meet that threat. Uh, and, and so that's what, uh, that's what this document tried to do. Uh, we do that through a, a, a new vision uh, and then through, uh, through uh, uh, four lines of effort uh, that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about here in a second, and then, and then our published end state. Great. And so that's really going to take us uh, to 2028 in line with the Army vision uh, and, and the Army strategy. Well, before we kind of get to the lines of effort and, and all that, uh, maybe talk a little bit about the vision, yep. the, the, the appropriate adjectives and all that there. And uh, in particular, you know, what's the relative salience of air and missile defense in terms of multi-domain operations? Right. So, so the vision is for the air and missile defense forces of 2028 to be able to provide the combatant commanders a flexible, agile force capable of uh, uh, creating windows of opportunity uh, in multiple domains um, and in support of the unified uh, land operations. Uh, we're going to do that uh, through modernization. We're going to do that through development of new capabilities. We're going to do that uh, through uh, training. We're going to do that through growth, capacity building, if you will. And then we're going to do that through integration with our allies and partners and our sister services. So what do the words flexible and agile mean for Army Air and Missile Defense? So flexibility, uh, we need to be able to rapidly adapt to changing the conditions on the battlefield, right? Um, no plan ever survives first contact, I think is a, is a very old saying. Um, and so our forces need to be uh, highly adaptable to, to what we see and we need to be able to mix and match our capabilities to meet the emerging threat as conditions change. Uh, agile, we've got to rapidly react. Uh, combat in the future is going to move uh, at, the, at the speed of relevance. And we've got to stay ahead of that curve uh, and be able to position our forces uh, to provide the protection to the combatant commanders and the, and the supported uh, land components uh, not in time, but before the enemy has, has a chance uh, to influence uh, land operations. So I think it was when uh, General Milley rolled out the, uh, the six new uh, <laughs> priorities for the Army. Uh, he went through long-range precision fires and lethality and all this stuff, and then he says, but none of that matters if you're dead. That's correct. And that's why you need air defense. Right. So what is it about the threat, about the challenge of lost air superiority? What is it about today's threat environment? that makes air and missile defense important for the great power challenge. So where's the threat going in other words? Yeah, so, so the threat is targeting, if you will, um, those assets that are critical to our ability to conduct combat operations. C2 nodes, um, ISR, our own systems, air defense systems. Just like we target the enemy, uh, he is looking to target us and take away our eyes and our long-range fires and our, and our capabilities. And so 
we need to be able uh, to, to be a, a position uh, to deny him the ability to take, take that away from us in order to allow freedom of maneuver for the combatant commander. I'll just say this is, I think, one of the things I really like about this document is it's very blunt. First of all, it doesn't min mince words about Russia and China, mm -hmm. and it's very blunt about the fact that they're going to try to disintegrate our air defenses. They're going to suppress our air defenses, because if you don't get the problem right, you're not going to get the solution right. right. Um, four lines of effort. What, what, what are they and what does that mean for, for the Army? So four lines of effort, and, and I, I should clarify that, that this document is, is, is really not um, doing anything new. It's really a synchronization of ongoing efforts um, that are being executed by, by various components of the Air and Missile Defense Enterprise. The first line of effort is uh, capability development and modernization. That's our programmatics. Our, our weapon systems, if you will, the, the what we're going to fight with. Um, and that is, that, is, uh, that is being led by the uh, Army Futures Command's uh, Air and Missile Defense uh, cross-functional team, uh, Brigadier General Brian Gibson uh, out of uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And he, in combination with the uh, uh, PEO Missiles in Space, have the air defense modernization strategy uh, that they've been working on. Within that are the programs of record uh, and developmental capabilities that we're, that we're bringing over the next, uh, uh, over the next decade. Uh, the second line of effort is capacity. So we have always been in an asset poor environment from an air defense perspective in that there's always more threat and higher demand than we have resources to provide. And so the Army has recognized that and, and we are going to grow uh, the Air and Missile Defense Force over, over the next uh, several years, several iterations of, of the, the, the TAA process. Uh, we, are, we are currently uh, approved to, uh, to grow three new uh, short-range air defense battalions, and we are expecting uh, to, to get the approval for additional battalions in the next uh, annual cycle. Uh, that will add to our already existing capability. Uh, we're going to uh, sustain our Patriot and THAAD forces and then we will end up um, increasing uh, our short-range air defense with the uh, uh, indirect fire protection capability, the IFPIC, um, that will, will supplement uh, and be additive to the, uh, the short-range fight for those fixed and semi-fixed assets. Uh, the third uh, line of effort is, is training. Okay? Uh, if you think about what we are going to ask the force to do over the next decade as it modernizes as it changes the way we fight for multi-domain operations, um, as we bring on new capabilities, uh, our soldiers and leaders must be capable of employing those systems in the new uh, battlefield framework uh, in support of multi-domain operations. So our schoolhouse uh, and our institutional training base and our generating force has got to change and adapt uh, to be able to provide those leaders uh, that capability and that background education and continuing education that goes further into our uh, test and experimentation ranges, our national training centers, the CTCs, um, and the whole way we do uh, training and evaluations, uh, leveraging uh, the, uh, the synthetic training environment, CFT, uh, which will be coming online for initial capability in 21. And then our final line of effort is uh, integration with our allies and partners. Um, it is not a, a foreseeable uh, situation where we as Army Air Defenders would be fighting alone. Um, we will almost certainly uh, be uh, fighting the away game, and so we are, we are very dependent on the capabilities and, and contributions of our allies and our partners and really our sister services, because uh, air and missile defense is a joint uh, combined endeavor, uh, and we are much stronger together uh, than we are alone. So, so you, you, on, that, on the third uh, I think it was the third uh, line of effort training. for training. Yes, sir. Um, you know, I think your, your boss, General Dickinson, uh, talks a lot about kind of the culture of being so used to air superiority that we mm -hmm. forgot about things like passive defense, right. emissions control, lit cigarette at night, things like that. Uh, you also met the combined arms, or alluding to kind of combined arms or CFADs, combined arms for air defense. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that within Big Army, as well as the Joint Air Force, what kind of training needs to be done or is going on to kind of acculturate folks to the fact that we don't have air superiority against the big guys? So you're right. And, and over, you know, again, over the last 15 or so years, uh, 
Air threats were not something we worried about with the exception of the, the rockets, artillery, and mortars on the FOBs. Um, but in, in future fights, uh, those things that we used to do very routinely, um, the passive defense, the dispersion, um, the, uh, the noise light litter discipline that you talked about, um, are things that we need to relearn, not just in the air defense community, but passive defense is really a, a requirement for the whole force. Uh, and so we are starting to reinvigorate uh, those procedures out at the CTCs, the National Training Center. Uh, we're bringing air threat back uh, to NTC, uh, and we're putting uh, OCs, air defense OCs, back out at the training centers. Um, and and as, as we have the ability to do so, given the high op tempo, we are putting air defense assets out at the National Training Center so that the brigade combat teams can get used to maneuvering uh, with air and missile defense forces again. And so that, I think, is really going to be an education process for the force over the next couple of years uh, until it becomes second nature again. And that passive defense, or dispersal, deception, all yep. this kind of stuff, uh, that's, of course, a critical piece of uh, how in joint vocabulary we talk about IAMD. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, this is a document that's called Air and Missile Defense, not Integrated Air and Missile right. Defense. Can you speak to why that is? So, so and I know, I know you want to get to the definition of, of integrated versus interop. So in, in our mind, there are really three steps to integration, right? First is interdependency, which is really what we are now. We have, we have many separate legacy systems that operate uh, more or less together but with their own fire control networks, okay? The next step would be interoperability, where you have many systems that are still probably working with their own distinct fire control systems, but they're working together a as a holistic capability. And then finally, the nirvana, if you will, is integrated, where it's all these systems working as a single uh, system of systems with a shared fire control, shared sensors, potentially shared interceptors, uh, that allows a, a much better uh, layered tiered approach to air and missile defense. And so when we, when we wrote the document uh, from, from the Army perspective, uh, that integrated piece is, is just not there yet. And so we thought it a little bit presumptuous to call it IAMD when, when we're not there. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's, that's very nice, nicely said. Uh, but that is, of course, still a vision. And the Absolutely. Army still has its Army IAMD right. umbrella of, of programs, of course. Um, but that's very nice. Uh, so let me kind of connect this with the national defense strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked a little bit about Russia and China, but in particular the NDS's uh, concept of dynamic force employment. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean concretely as opposed to just moving stuff around? What does that mean for Army Air and Missile Defense? So the dynamic force employment concept is the ability to take strategic assets uh, uh, and, and employ them rapidly um, around the world uh, in order to, it does a couple things. One, it demonstrates our ability to do that, okay? Uh, two, it demonstrates resolve, uh, and, it, and it demonstrates uh, a shared relationship with our, with our foreign allies and partners. Um, and the, the, the recent DFE to Israel um, demonstrated unequivocally, both to our friends and our potential adversaries, that the United States was capable of taking a THAAD battery, uh, rapidly deploying it uh, to a foreign country where, oh, by the way, it had never been before, and fully integrating it into a, into a, a foreign nation's defensive architecture uh, to then do uh, training and exercises with that host nation, and then to redeploy it. Which is an important part, because these yes. things sometimes go and then they don't come back. Uh. <laughs> right. Um, and, and so. That demonstrated, again, very clearly uh, to friends and allies and adversaries the capability that just because a strategic asset is not located in your theater um, doesn't mean it can't be there very quickly. Uh, and so it helps with that deterrent uh, factor um, out of, out of multi-domain operations uh, and really leads you to a passive defense answer as well. So, so I want to kind of get to lots of different pieces, uh, programs, things like that. But before I, I do that, I also want to flag that this document seems unusually, again, blunt and explicit about risks and assumptions. Right. You want to speak to that and kind of, you're right up front about that. If you don't do this, you're not going to get your force you want in state by 2028. Right. Our, our assumptions and our risks are tied together. Um, 
we have a plan of, of where we want to go between now and, and 2028. There are things that are beyond our control um, that can happen that could cause that plan to change. And we wanted to, we wanted to look at that ahead of time, make sure that en and everybody understood what those were. The first is, is no big surprise is, is money. Um, the, the cost of the Patriot portfolio is fairly large. Um, and it takes sustained, committed funding because of the length of time these programs take to, to field fully to the force. If, if we don't have that sustained, assured funding through the course of the program development, then we run the risk of not being able to achieve our desired end state. Um, technology development, um, especially when you talk about uh, counter hypersonics and directed energy and electronic warfare, um, we believe that we're on the right path uh, to deliver the capabilities uh, in the next you know, five years or so uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, the, the 50KW and the 100KW. However, um, there could be technological challenges that we haven't anticipated and, and certainly integrating those uh, technologies into a common weapons platform that is, you know, survives testing and does all that kind of stuff. Um, there, there is always the, the opportunity for things to, to slip. And so we want to make sure that uh, we take that into account as we're moving forward. Um, and so I think going in with eyes wide open, if you will, about those, those assumptions and, and risks to, to the plan, it gives us a better understanding of what our, our, our starting point is and, and how we're going to get there. Yeah, I, I thought the document was, was very uh, explicit, for instance, about directed energy in particular. Mm -hmm. that you we will not have the capability or the, the, the ability to deal with the, the, the size of the threat if we don't get directed energy, especially for the lower end, mm -hmm. uh, the lower end stuff. Uh, so why don't we just sort of walk through some of the, the big pieces sure. uh, of the solution, especially on the material side. Um, maybe let's just start with MSHORAD. Uh, kind of start there and work our way up. Uh, what's sort of the state of, of MSHORAD? Why is that? Why was that such such a high priority? The first kind of priority for the CFT to go out and get that right. So, as we talked about, the threat is emerging or, or re-emerging, if you will, uh, with the the ability uh, to use uh, UASs to to uh, target with indirect fires, uh, with the advances in in cruise missiles manned uh, fixed wing and rotor wing is a threat again uh, some, from some very capable platforms. Uh, we found the fact that we had really decimated, uh, and that's the chief's words, we had decimated the air defense force in terms of short range air defense capability, which left our maneuvering forces, the brigade combat teams, uh, virtually unprotected. Um, and so that became uh, the air defense portfolio's priority was to get some capability back into the maneuver force. Uh, we did that through a couple things. The first is the, uh, the chief initiated a, a project where we, we went out and we, we trained uh, stinger teams uh, back up, man portable stinger teams back up, uh, and they're they are in the BCTs and that project continues to, to move forward. And then we started work on what the programmers or records are gonna be. And, and so right now we have the interim MSHORAD capability um, that the, the contracts were awarded last year. That's going to be a, a turret gun missile system on a striker platform. And right now, uh, the, the vendors are, are bending metal, if you will, uh, creating the, the first four uh, off the assembly line. And we'll continue to do that to a, to a number of, of 144 systems uh, that will field uh, in the early 2020s. Okay. Um, the objective MSHORAD capability is, is still a decision to be made uh, in the future uh, based on the, con the, the continued appetite for growth uh, and, and as new capabilities uh, come online, we'll, we'll incorporate those in. MSHORAD uh, is, uh, is planned to have a directed energy capability um, in, in the mid 2020s um, and that will be integrated along with the other MSHORAD platforms at, at varying um, proportions, if you will, of, of weapon systems. Um, you know, because one of the things we, we've learned is many people believe that directed energy is going to be the answer to everything. Um, and it's not. Uh, what the objective MSHORAD capability is going to be is a combination of gun, <coughs> missile, electronic, directed energy capabilities, either on a single platform or multiple platforms, working in concert 
uh, to protect the maneuver force. Yeah, the document was, uh, was again, upfront about the fact that it, you were taking risk on the capacity side for M. Shorad in order, you know, smaller numbers on a striker so as to move around more quickly on the m maneuver, a, a trade in other words. Right, a absolutely. If we can't uh, keep pace with the, the forces we're protecting, um, or if we c we're not as survivable as the forces we're protecting, uh, then we're really more of a hindrance than we are an asset. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want that to happen, so that's why we went with the, the smaller numbers more quickly into the force on, on the striker. Okay, so if pick, if pick. This is, a, this is a, again, a category that's, that's undergoing a little bit of change. I think mm -hmm. maybe the CFT is kind of shifting to that a little bit, indirect fires protection capability. Um, what's going on with MML and, and, and this stuff? Uh, in terms, in so, terms of what so, so right now, uh, the Army um, has, has uh, gotten the approval to meet the NDAA language to procure two Iron Dome batteries that will serve as an interim uh, IFPIC capability until we can get to the objective uh, system or the enduring capability. That enduring capability has not been decided on yet. Um, what, we're, what it will be is, is a, a missile-based platform um, that will be, be built specifically to defend uh, fixed and semi-fixed assets uh, in support of, of the, the maneuvering, maneuvering force and the operational um, uh, battle space. Um, it will work in concert with, uh, with MSHORAD. It'll be, a, it'll be a layered tiered capability um, that, that, you know, eventually you'll have IFPIC and, and MSHORAD in, in the same unit. Uh, under the same commander. Composite unit. You know. Composite unit, uh, mixed capabilities, as well as you'll have VFPIC integrated into the, into the Patriot formations. So on the concert side, the, the mm -hmm. concert between IFPIC and M. Shorad, uh, but of course IFPIC is less maneuverable, less, so yeah. how's that, how's that gonna work? What, what kinds of, uh, what kinds of concert are going on there? So, so if you think about a, a, a divisional maneuver battle space, right? You have your brigade combat teams uh, out engaging in close fight with, with the enemy. That's where your maneuver shore ad, your M shore ad is going to be, your striker base variants. Well, in the, in the other portions of that division of battle, battle space, you'll have things like forward operating bases uh, for the aviation. Uh, you'll have combat trains, uh, those that, that, are, that require defenses uh, but are not maneuvering. Uh, so they are fixed and semi-fixed, and that's really where IFPIC is going to is, is going to be employed um, to help provide protection at, at, that, at that level. But th that, again, is a, a choice of not having, for instance, higher tier, say, cruise missile defense mm -hmm. for the maneuvering force, right? So if it, targeting, I, I'm not sure the maneuver force is a great cruise missile target. Um, could be. Um, you know, and certainly as, as capabilities develop, um, we'd like to bring you know, a full capability to the maneuver force. Uh, that said, the commander, because he has both capabilities within his formation, he has the flexibility to employ those uh, capabilities to best defend the assets he's required to defend against the threat he's presented. And so, uh, I, in my mind, it adds flexibility uh, rather than it degrades his capability. Okay. Uh, and those Iron Dome batteries we're getting, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be, they're going to include the radar and everything. Are they going to be to what extent integrated with other Army systems, U.S. Army systems? So, so we're, the, yes, the Iron Domes are, are off the shelf, if you will. Um, and, and initially, uh, there will be standalone capabilities. Uh, of course, we will do, you know, experimentation uh, and demonstration with them to see how much we can integrate them in. But keep in mind that those Iron Dome batteries are an interim, okay? They're not the objective, uh, and, and we know that going in, and so, um, they will be, they will be uh, and the decision has not been made, the Army will determine the best place to put those uh, for the capability that they are, uh, and then we'll see where it grows from there. All right, well, let's keep moving to, to Patriot. Sure. Uh, what's going on in terms of the Patriot system of today? Mm -hmm. and of course, I think it was just Bahrain announced the 17th Patriot, so that's a, that's a thing uh, out there, lots of other countries. But in terms of the, the post-deployment builds, sort of the incremental evolution, and then we'll kind of get the LTAMs as well. On a yeah, so, so PDB-8, the post-deployment build uh, 8, uh, is, is currently uh, fee being fielded. Uh, the big capability that that brings uh, to the system is obviously the integration of the MSC missile, uh, which, which allows a, a much greater range, much better capability at a, at a higher altitude. 
um, as well as some updated fire control software and those sorts of things. Um, and, and really, it's, it's a continuing upgrade of the system that, that the, the vendor provides. Um, and so, and that is, is, is doing very well as proceeding as planned. And as you mentioned, the foreign military sales on the Patriot weapon system uh, seem to be uh, doing very well. Um, and that's a good thing uh, because uh, the ability to, to fight with, with systems that we are familiar with uh, makes the integration or the interoperability uh, with our foreign allies and partners much easier. Um, the next step for Patriot uh, will be LTAMS. Uh, the lower tier air and missile defense sensor, which is, is getting ready. The vendors are getting ready to enter the, uh, the sense off uh, out, at, out at White Sands, uh, where they will put these sensors um, through, a, through a, a various litany of, of tests and, and trials, uh, at which case, which will inform uh, the Army's decision and the down select to a, to a vendor for the, then the, uh, the prototype production uh, of the lower tier air and missile defense sensor. What LTAMS is going to do for the force is it will, will replace the, the current Patriot radar, which um, is, is, let's be honest, it's, it's getting old. Um, still very capable, but it, it is time to, to replace it, uh, the legacy systems. And the LTAMS uh, will then allow the, the full kinematic capability of that MSC missile, um, which provides a, a much longer range. Uh, it also provides updated uh, fire control capability, better data. Uh, for that sort of thing that allows earlier engagements. Right. So kind of connecting LTAMs and, and kind of the next thing along the way here, IBCS. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, lots of conversation about what, what LTAMs are going to be. 360 is, the, the threat is 360. You call Correct. that out in this document. Yep. The threat's 360. And there's sort of been some noise about, well, will LTAMs actually have 360, not merely as, a, as an objective requirement, but as a threshold requirement off the, off the, off the line. Um, do you want to talk to that and kind of what's the trades going on there? So, so this is what I'll tell you. Right now, uh, in the uh, uh, 360 is, a, is an objective requirement uh, for the system, not a threshold. Uh, I do think many of the vendors are bringing uh, a, a pretty good capability uh, to look uh, beyond what we would consider Patriot's normal sector. Um, and then you alluded to IFPIC. There are lots of sensors on the battlefield, and so... Uh, if you if you take uh, or I'm sorry IBCS yeah, yeah. if you take uh, IBCS to fruition that that really allows uh, the integration of, of sensors and shooters into a single networked environment do I need every sensor to be 360 all the time or is the composite picture that I gain from a multitude of sensors working in concert uh, good enough uh, you know the question will be you know you have to you have to see the target in order and characterize the target in order to engage the target and being able to use the various sensors through the IBCS and then placing your interceptors in the right locations to provide you that 360 capability it is a challenge that, that we've got to work through. Right, of course, assuming, of course, there's enough sensors in the neighborhood. Uh, absolutely. And you're assuming you're not moving around and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, again, and that's the great thing about uh, the IBCS is it allows you to build that task force, if you will, of air and missile defense capabilities tailored to the threat environment that you're facing. Because yeah. um, certainly how you would employ those systems will vary based on uh, what terrain, uh, what environment, what threat you're facing. So IBCS, since you mentioned, uh, network centrism is still kind of the foundation of, mm -hmm. of all this. So what's kind of the status of that program? What role does that play uh, for the future vision here? So, so IBCS uh, is currently being developed, uh, as you know, by the vendor. It will go into a, a limited user test uh, next year uh, and, then, uh, and then into, uh, into production uh, in, in the early 20s and begin fielding and eventually uh, replace the legacy command and control uh, uh, nodes um, at, uh, at uh, the various battalions, batteries, uh, brigades, etc. Uh, IBCS, when it comes to fruition, will be a game changer. I mean, really the ability to take any sensor with any interceptor, intercept capability into a single integrated fire control now gives you unprecedented flexibility to design a, a defense uh, for a battlefield. Um, and so that's going to enable us to use the right number of assets, right? Because right now we have to deploy a Patriot battalion to go defend a single asset. 
uh, which is, is a huge waste of manpower uh, and equipment uh, when maybe it's only a battery or a battery plus mission. Mm -hmm. IBCS will allow us to tailor that and scale it to exactly what's required uh, for a given for a given scenario, and this is you know it's, it's the integration. It's also interoperability. Mm -hmm. You're seeing this in a in a broader way. Thinking, for instance, the uh, the the more immediate nearer term uh, interoperability with Patriot and Thad, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, right. putting things together and getting approaching that. Not quite integration, but approaching that in, in different ways uh, to permit more dispersal right. uh, and all these kinds of things. Um, uh, how about Thad then? Uh, anything going on on the, on the Thad program? So, Would you like to talk to? So Thad, uh, you know, Thad is 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 still a uh, an MDA development program. Um, uh, both they and the A and two forward base mode radars, uh, they continue uh, their spiral development and upgrades of, of those systems um, uh, as planned. Uh, and and I think what you're going to see over the next uh, decade is a continued improvement of, of those platforms. Uh, to, to keep pace with the threat and normal modernization uh, and upgrade with those. Good. All right. Well, I think I'm going to pause here and open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, uh, we've got some microphones in the back if you want to just uh, uh, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and if, just ask if you would identify who you are and, and keep it in the form of a, of a question. And I saw Sydney first, so I'll uh, let's, let's do, do him first. Thanks, Sydney Friedberg, breaking defense, professional, importunate person. Uh, let me ask, I mean, you, you talked about your relationship with the air missile defense CFT, mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at this you know, more broadly, uh, you, this you know, AMD does not stand or fall in isolation. I mean, it sounds like IBCS, you're building your own network, but you presumably have some tie into the network team uh, if you want to address left of launch, uh, you have some need some tie into the to LRPF, mm -hmm. uh, the long range fi fires, which conversely probably need you to protect their batteries from the enemy's long range fires. Uh, you know, presumably need some kind of EW and cyber defense to protect this IBCS network, uh, so you're not depend on remote sensors. Uh, and then lose access to them because the enemy cut your comms. So how do you, you know, plug AMD into this much wider context of Army uh, modernization? Right, so thanks, Sydney. Um, so IBCS has, has got a couple of attributes to it uh, that, are, that are key. One is the idea it's a self-healing network. So if a, if a node or a link is, is down or compromised, you don't lose the whole network, right? Um, likewise, it has, it has linkages into the, the joint uh, uh, fire control and sensor networks in order to provide that, that data both up and down uh, for a, a much better integrated uh, air picture uh, from, a, from a joint interoperability uh, perspective. When you get to your foreign allies and partners, uh, certainly we would, we would uh, encourage uh, our allies and partners uh, to, to make systems that are compatible uh, with our IBCS capability. It'd be much easier to bring them into the network if, if they're already built that way. Um, but we need, to make, uh, we need to make sure that we're working closely with them so we understand what their, their capabilities and network architectures are and are not so that we can integrate them the best uh, that we are able at the given time. That, that get what you needed? I, I think he was also alluding to kind of offense, offensive, offensive fires defensive here, which is in this okay, sure. Yeah. So, so as you may know, the, the Air and Missile Defense CFT uh, is right down the hallway from the Long Range Precision Fire CFT. Uh, and they, those two uh, directors uh, talk a lot. Um, there is uh, an appetite, I think, uh, for uh, at least from, from the AMD side of the house, uh, to get closer to the to the offensive capability because it, that's attack operations, right? Um, and and every threat that the long range precision fires or the offensive fires takes out before it's utilized is one less that I have to deal with in, in the in the terminal or, or defensive mode. Um, and and so that's something that we're we're clearly working towards, uh, trying to get that that offensive and defensive integration. Not necessarily on the same platform, uh, not necessarily even within the same formation, but being able to share that data, share those sensors, right, um, back and forth, uh, is is a benefit to, to both communities. Okay. Now, does that mean well, IBCS does not have that level of 
as of today, as of today, IBCS does not have the, the offensive integration piece. All right. Um, I think this gentleman straight back here. Good afternoon. My name is Dong Yeon Kim from Voice America Korean Service. Uh, last week, uh, about the new, uh, North Korean uh, missile fire, uh, they f fired with uh, mixed launch rockets. And there is some analysis that it is a short range ballistic missile, and it may not be uh, <coughs> possible to defend uh, U.S. assets inside North, uh, South Korea because of the distance. Uh, how, I how do you assess the threat, and is there any uh, plans to? Uh, to, to update with uh, protecting the ally and, and the U.S. Uh, asset outside United States? Okay, so um, I, I won't speak directly to that because I haven't been to Korea in several years. Um, but, you know, as, as I talked to it at the beginning, the threat is always evolving, right? And the threat is always becoming more challenging. And so it's important that we continue to analyze that threat and ensure that we are providing the best capability we can uh, to both the maneuver, the fix, semi-fix, and the operational strategic assets uh, to defend not only U.S. Uh, uh, assets, but integration with our partners and allies to provide the best defense uh, for whatever theater that we happen to be in. Okay. Let this gentleman over here. Two, two back to back right here. Hi, thank you very much. I'm with Sky News Arabia. And, and in the, I came a little bit late, but I briefed through the, the study. Um, in addition to China and Russia, North Korea and Iran are mentioned as developing threats. You just referred to it. Which one would you say is more of a threat and why? Um, Between North Korea and Iran. Isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> An easy question. Um, so, so the, the national defense strategy makes it, it very clear. Our, our, our priority, if you will, is, is, is the, the reemergence of, of the great competition powers, Russia and China, okay? And that is what we would call our, our pacing threat, right? Because uh, that's the, the most capable enemy we could face. But certainly that doesn't, that doesn't reduce the threat uh, uh, from, from rogue states, North Korea, Iran, or, or even the terrorist capabilities. You know, if you think about what can be done with, with uh, unmanned aerial systems uh, and some of the, the uh, weapons that have proliferated, uh, you know, to, to some terrorist organizations, it's something that we've, we've got to worry about across the board. But our priority based on the, on the national defense strategy is the, is the reemergence of the, of the great power competition with Russia and China. Uh, Byron. Sure, thanks, sir. Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. We've got about 15 battalions of Patriots, if I'm uh, correct. It seems there's still a fair amount of upside pressure on that force structure. And I'm just curious, you know, how do you think about building more capacity into that existing force structure with actually asking for more battalions? So I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you, are you asking if we're looking to increase the Patriot capacity? That would be one, one okay. way, yep. uh, approach. And then the other is, what could you do with the existing what could you do with the existing force to actually increase its capacity? I think you mentioned IBCS, sure. Sure. for example. No, a absolutely. Fe effective capacity. Yeah, and, you, and you're spot on. So yeah, we have, we have 15 battalions of Patriot, right? And, and the op tempo for Patriot over the last two decades has been pretty high. Uh, and we don't see that changing any time in the near future. What we can do, though, is when IBCS is now available, instead of deploying a battalion, you know, we're, we can now de to deploy a battery. Right, um, and then you do things like uh, the the dismounted uh, deployable ICC, which allows you to again deploy a much smaller element uh, to protect uh, what you need to protect, rather than the whole unit. That will take some of the pressure off uh, the the total Patriot force, right? Because we're not deploying the whole thing; we're just deploying a part. Uh, additionally, it gives us flexibility. And then, you know, in many cases, we deploy Patriot because it's it's what we've got. Um, when you get maneuver shorehead capability and then when if pick capability, especially once you get directed energy added in, that can offset uh, some of those target sets that, that Patriot is, is commonly called on to, to defend against uh, simply because it's available. 
or capable, I guess is a better way to put it. Great. All right. Well, well tell you what, we've got uh, this gentleman right here and then over here. Uh, uh, my name is Steve Traver, sir. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if I could, just kind of ask uh, two questions that are interrelated. The first is on allied participation at the R&D and acquisition level, um, uh, especially with the advanced technologies uh, where um, we're still fishing around for the right answer. Uh, the comments you made about directed energy is what really popped in my head. There's a lot of effort on the allies part to get involved in that. But the related part is uh, the statement in the report about immediate investments in training and test ranges. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the same problem across DOD uh, with uh, training and test ranges, not only infrastructure, but just making them big enough. Right. Um, uh, with uh, these higher kinetic forces and, and the addition of directed energy. Um, uh, so my question is, uh, 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 are we being uh, particularly proactive in trying to get the allies to get involved here vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship that we obviously have with Israel over on the kinetic side? And the other is, who are you guys looking to in OSD? Because this is an OSD problem. Who are you guys looking to in OSD to deal with this problem we're going to be facing about getting the training ranges and test ranges big enough that we can be realistic? Okay, so I'll answer that in two parts. Um, specifically to the, to the foreign partner involvement in the... Uh, in the development of our, of our advanced technologies, the DEEW. Um, I'll tell you just, just flat out, that's beyond my scope. Um, uh, you know, that's, uh, that is something that you'd probably have to take up with the proponent offices. I do know that, that several of our partners and allies are working on like capabilities, and certainly we would, we would like their capabilities to be complementary to ours. Uh, but as for specifics on, on which countries and, and how far along, I'm just not prepared to, to speak. Um, as far as the, the training ranges, absolutely. Most of our training ranges uh, were built several decades ago and were, were designed to, to work the weapon systems that, that existed then. Uh, as we move forward into to future capabilities, longer range weapon systems, directed energy, EW, the range capability and capacity has to increase uh, in order to keep pace in order to meet the requirements for testing and experimentation, et cetera. Um, and you're right, this is not an Army problem per se, although certainly we, we are looking at our own uh, ranges. It is a, it is a joint problem uh, that, that goes not only for air and missile defense, but really for all the weapons systems platforms that are, that are coming along, both air and, and land and, and truthfully sea-based, uh, depending. Um, who specifically is working that at, at OSD? Again, I, I'd, I'd have to defer you to, to the joint staff uh, to answer, answer that question. All right, I think, Danielle, we got one right here. Thank you. My name is uh, Sang Min Lee. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. I want to ask a question about uh, North Korea again. So as you he said, there was um, a project called North Korea launched last Saturday. One of them is even known that the short-range missile, a ballistic missile similar to Russian uh, thing. But there is one honest about that. It did a uh, ballistic missile at, the, at that time, the flight or altitude is about 40 to 50 kilometer. So one expert said that 40 to 50 kilometer is uh, between the Patriot, the uh, Patriot uh, missile defense battery can intercept and the, what the, the third uh, system can intercept, which means that altitude is between Patriot and Assad. Therefore, it will it, be a big, big, big problem for the missile deficit in, in Korea. So how do you see this uh, analysis about that? Well, so I, again, I'd, I'd go back. I'd, I don't have the specifics on the, on the shots that happened over the weekend other than what I've, I've read in the papers. Um, and, and it goes back. The threat is always going to evolve, right? And, and, it's, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a never-ending cycle of we build a capability to defeat what, we, what the threat is, and the threat evolves that capability to make it harder for us to defeat it. And then we, build a, we, we adjust our, our defensive capabilities to, to counter what he's just done. And that continues to go. That's the natural cycle of, of weapons uh, development and weapons defense. Um, as to, as to the, the capabilities of, 
of our current systems ag against uh, against what what was shot on on, on over the weekend. I I'm just not prepared to talk because I don't I don't have the I don't have the data. I don't have the facts. I haven't looked at. Okay. Who else? This chip right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael McKee from Intrepid. As, as you step forward, you, you mentioned the present day into uh, interoperability and then finally into integrated. Mm -hmm. What challenges do you foresee in the command and control implications of doing that? Especially when you got the, the land, force, uh, land force command in say maritime. Are those right. seams gonna start to change? Right, so, you know, so certainly integration briefs very well, doesn't it? Um, and and it, it is a hard thing to do, There's, especially when you talk, you know, it's hard enough when you talk U.S. to U.S. systems because each service currently has its own fire control network, its own command and control, and we're working towards uh, getting those to, to share data and to be able to, to leverage each other's data. That, and, and that's where I, I would say that, you know, we get to the interoperability part. Integration is going to come, I think, when, when from an air defense perspective, the services go, if not to a single air and missile defense, joint air and missile defense uh, fire control network, but at least one that has seamless flow of data between the fire control networks of the services. And that's where we're, we're trying to go. When you get to the, the allies and partners, it becomes much more difficult because now you're not just sharing U.S. to U.S. data, but you have to share U.S. to foreign. And there becomes all the concerns about foreign disclosure, technology release, proprietary information. Oh, by the way, there is the possibility that they may be using uh, former uh, Eastern Bloc or Soviet equipment. And, and what are the risks versus rewards of integrating that into your existing network? What cyber uh, vulnerabilities do you introduce by, by bringing a foreign system uh, into your network? Those are all things that, that we've got to work through, uh, and they're going to be hard. Um, they're going to take a lot of, uh, of technical capability um, and, and, and hard thinking on, on how we're going to do that. But I think the takeaway is, and, and specifically what we tried to talk in the document is, regardless of the level of capability that an ally or partner brings to the fight, we want to be able to utilize that capability to the best possible method, or best possible way, right? Uh, whether, whether or not because of cybersecurity risks we can't plug them directly into our systems, they can still be a significant contributor on the battlefield. We just have to think about what's the best way to do it and how to get around that until we can get to a point where we can confirm the data is safe and share it back and forth. So, so the, the integration or even interoperability with allies is challenging for the reasons you talked about. And mm -hmm. earlier you talked about both the quest for integrated fire control between and among Army systems. We're, we're still working on the interoperability things, even within the Army. But let me talk about the joint piece. Okay. You know, I think it was uh, then Admiral, now Ad Ambassador Harris, who was you know, going to the Hill and saying, I want every Navy and Army thing talking seamlessly. This document talks about that a little bit. But how are we doing? How is Army AMD doing in terms of talking, or let's just say, being interoperable with Navy and Air Force? So, so there's been a lot of, of, lot of good work uh, going that way. Of course, the Navy has you know, its CEC, uh, which works very well for the ships. Um, but it doesn't translate as well to land. Um, but I think IBCS uh, will, will, um, will be on the Link network. You know, the Link 16 network is the is going to be the joint uh, air missile defense network, if you will. Uh, and so we will, we will have IBCS from an Army perspective linking into the, to the Link 16 network with the Air Force and the Navy partners, eventually continuing to evolve uh, the capability over the next you know, several years, uh, really decades, uh, until we get to that, to that seamless data flow. Um, you know, it's all about data and, and how fast you can get the data from from a sensor to a fire control to an engagement capability, uh, and who really has the, the best opportunity. And what, what you're really talking about uh, from the joint perspective is, you know, there's, there's an easily and imaginable possibility where you'll have a target and you have an Army, Navy, and Air Force capability all with an opportunity. And the ability to visualize that 
and then make an informed engagement decision from the joint level which capability to employ that most effectively defeats the target while maintains efficiency for the force is, is again, it's that nirvana we talked about. We'd certainly like to get there. But if I can stay on that for a minute, short of nirvana, short of let's nirvana. just sort of say Eden or something. Okay. I, don't, right. I don't know what it is. But, but isn't it fair to say that there's a kind of centripetal force in terms of the material development of the several services that you know, just trying to get Army systems to talk to, to each other, talking to Navy and, and Air Force is, at least at the level of culture, seemingly a less of a priority. There doesn't seem to be an OSD-wide thumb coming down saying, thou shalt pass that data in the way that you're talking about. So I, I'd, I'd defer to the Joint Staff for, for that, uh, but I will tell you that at least from an Army perspective, uh, and, and if you go out to the, uh, the combatant commands, uh, there are several joint multinational experiments, demonstrations, exercises, where we routinely link in with our Air Force and our Navy partners um, and share data back and forth. And we'd, we've been doing cooperative engagement exercises um, since the early 90s, uh, where we've, we've done uh, track deconfliction, track identification, uh, engagement, battle handoff, those sorts of things. So that work is continuing and being done um, as, as we move forward. Okay. I think we got time maybe for one more question. Uh, if folks want to weigh in, well, if you don't, I've got I've uh -oh. got others uh, uh -oh. right up here. JD Johnson, <laughs> you wait for the microphone, sir. Oh, okay. Good to see JD you, JD Johnson with Raytheon. Uh, appreciate Tom and and Chad both your time. Uh, we talk frequently about breaking the cost curve. You know that that there are you know, technology is being proliferated and becoming less and less expensive to the threats. So where do you see the greatest opportunities to get after this problem as, as you're looking at? And how, if at all, does the strategy address it? Good to see you, sir. Um, so yeah, the, the, you know, the, and you may have seen it, my boss shows a slide uh, where it, when you get to the air and missile defense terminal piece, right? So if you think Patriot, you think THAAD, you think really any ground-based air defense, by the time we are engaging the system, it's already done its entire flight path from launch through boost, through mid-course and, and into us. Um, and, and that is the most expensive, most challenging way to defeat that threat. Um, and, and he has all the advantages, right? He knows where he's coming from, he knows how fast he's flying, he knows what he's targeting. We don't always know that. Um, it's much more cost effective to do an interdiction, attack operations, if you will, and kill him or kill his capability before he ever has the opportunity to employ it. Uh, I mean, that's what the Air Force has been doing for, for years and years and years, air interdiction. Um, and that goes back to what we were talking a little bit earlier with the, the offensive-defensive integration, um, sharing that data. So, so and it's, I don't think it's that far in the future where You'll be able to take sensor data from an air defense radar, provide that to an offensive uh, capability, be it kinetic, non-kinetic, that will then be able to kill the shooter. Maybe not for the first shot, but certainly for the second shot. Um, the, other, the other thing that, that will help is, is ISR, um, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. You know, we, we as an army and, and really as a joint force have never had the amount of ISR and the fidelity of ISR uh, that we want on the battlefield. Um, and, and General Hyten, the commander of STRATCOM, talks about that with the space sensor layer and being able to track birth to death um, and, and developing those ISR uh, capabilities to enable uh, rapid interdiction. Um, if you have um, sufficient intelligence uh, and sufficient um, um, you know, surveillance that you can see, say for example, a road mobile tell uh, moving out to a launch site, you know, and preparing to fire, and then you can rapidly translate that data into a offensive strike capability in sufficient time to engage that target before he fires, that's where you really want to go. And I think it's that offensive defensive integration investment as well as the investments in ISR uh, that are going to help us move towards that that uh, left side of the curve. 
you know, if I could engage that particular scenario, you, if you want to see that road mobile tell, it would be nice to have some, some more elevated assets. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you, know, you still got the curvature of the earth problem, you got the terrain problem. Right. Um, doesn't seem to have a place here, but, but isn't there still a requirement for some kind of elevated asset to see this stuff, not merely before it launches, but, but early in the launch? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, again, General Hyten talks about space sensor layer, which is obviously for, for larger uh, cap capabilities, you know, uh, against more ICBM, IRBM. Uh, but if you think about the cruise missile fight, right, uh, being able to look down uh, gives you a much better capability for seeing a cruise missile or, or hypersonic uh, missile. That look down capability will give you a much better, better picture uh, and enable an earlier uh, and potentially more frequent engagement. Um, you know, whether, you know, whether that be a, a terrestrial based aerostat, um, you know, I won't, I won't say the word, uh, but, uh, or whether it be a high altitude, uh, you know, airship, fixed wing, or whether it be a low Earth orbit satellite. The, the challenge is to get the data to somebody who can use it fast enough to enable an engagement. And I think that's where our current uh, ISR capabilities fall short is many of them are, are big, exquisite, you know, uh, satellites uh, that have very good detail, but it takes you several hours, if sometimes not days, to get the data. We need data that is targetable rapidly in time to affect a flight. Good. Well, kind of close that question here. I think of the, the document at one point talks about kind of the need for updates. This document yep. doesn't get out too far ahead of its skis in terms of second quarter of 2023 or anything like that. So, you know, is this going to become a living document? Yep. What, what it would updating this more than every seven years be important to stay the course here? Absolutely. Um, you know, no plan survives first contact. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we actually wrote it in the document. Uh, we intend to review this routinely. Uh, we haven't necessarily figured out if that's biennial, but we think that's probably about right, uh, or as major programmatic uh, events happen, uh, certainly. And we intend to publish updates, hmm. right? And un until, you know, the, the big piece out of this is, is the vision and the end state, right? And the lines of effort are going to continue. I think as long as those remain, remain valid, the document remains valid, and then we update those pieces that we need to uh, as, as additional capabilities come online and are fielded or something changes, you know, if our assumptions or, or risks uh, 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 don't prove out, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll change it. But we envision in this, this document uh, with, its, with its vision, LOEs, and end state getting us to 2028. Good. Well, Colonel Skaggs, thank you very much. It's been a, uh, a, a real deep dive into lots of what's going on sure. with Army Air and Missile Defense. Uh, we we'll just ask folks to, to join me outside uh, for a coffee break, and then we'll come back for a panel. But for right now, please join me in thanking uh, Colonel Skaggs. Thank you. Enjoyed it.
Uh, well, some very thoughtful see. people to kind of talk about the Hopefully Army strategy, put it in context. Uh, I want to uh, turn things over to our moderator for this panel, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Dick Formica. Uh, General Formica spent 36 years in the Army, had a, oh, a number nice. of posts in the Army. Uh, his final assignment, of course, was uh, the Commanding General of Space and Missile Defense Command. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to him. Before I do that, I also just want to recognize Senator John Warner. I appreciate you here, sir. Uh, we, we've seen you here at our events before. Thank you very much for, for coming out and for your, for your service. So, General Franco, over to you. Well, thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks to uh, each of you for being here and those that, uh, that are online. Uh, on behalf of the panel, I say good afternoon. For those of you that had an opportunity to hear it, I um, want to thank Tom Carrico and uh, Colonel Chad Skaggs again uh, for that thoughtful discussion on Army Air and Missile Defense 2028. Um, I think they provided a great understanding of where the Army's headed and how it intends to get, get there out to 2028. They've identified the need to address the full range of threats to provide a tiered approach to missile defense. Um, we l talked about offense and defense integration and the integration of lethal and non-lethal capabilities and the Army's four lines of effort to get, after, uh, to get after that. With this panel here as a follow-on, we intend to broaden the discussion and to build on it and to look at uh, AMD 2028 from different perspectives. And then we'll, uh, as uh, Dr. Carrico did, we'll take questions from the audience. So to that end, CSIS has assembled a really uh, stellar panel. Let me introduce. First, Dr. Pepe DiBiaso, who's the Director of the Office of Missile Defense Policy in the Office of Secretary of Defense. It's a position he's held for over 18 years. He's been an adjunct professor in National Security Affairs. He's got think tank experience and, as you know, is in the office principally responsible for the drafting of the Missile Defense Review. He'll be followed by Dr. Kathleen Hicks, Senior Vice President and the Dr. Henry Kissinger Chair for International Security Program here at CSIS. She's a former Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and a Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans and Forces, and she was a member of the National Commission on the Future of the Army. Uh, Mr. Peter Woody Woodmansey is the Division Chief for Integrated Air and Missile Defense, United States European Command. He's been in that position for 10 years. He's a retired United States Marine Corps Colonel with over 25 years of uniform service. And then finally, uh, Colonel Mike Solis, Division Chief, Joint Integrated Air and Missile Defense Organization, JAMDO, J-8 in the Joint Staff. He's a U.S. Army Air Defense Officer. Colonel Solis has served for over two decades, and prior to his Jayamdo time, he served as both the Chief of Staff and the G3 at the 32nd uh, Army Air and Missile Defense Command. So this panel brings unique and varying insights and perspectives to this discussion. And uh, we're going to offer them the opportunity to make opening comments for five to seven minutes, and then that will leave plenty of time for your questions. So let me first turn the floor over to Pepe DiBiaso. Great, great. All right. Thank you, Dick. Uh, I didn't hear the earlier part of the discussion, so I'm going to proceed as though uh, there isn't too much redundancy here. So hopefully, hopefully that, that, that supposition proves to be true. So what I'd like to do is I've uh, been asked to give a few remarks uh, that set the DOD policy framework uh, with regard to integrated air and missile defense. I'm going to continue to use the I part. I understand in the earlier discussion um, it was mostly the AMD piece, but really the long-term objective is to sort of get to the integrated uh, piece of, of air and missile defense and talk a little bit about how the Missile Defense Review sort of framed up this issue. Uh, the very name of the Missile Defense Review gives you an indication right, that the department is thinking about missile threats in a larger and more comprehensive uh, term. And consequently, right, we're thinking about the defense solutions in a, in a, in a, in a, in a broader way. Uh, you probably heard in the discussion earlier today that it's more than just ballistic missile threats, but I will keep making the point that we continue to deal uh, with large numbers of ballistic missiles and countries continue to acquire those capabilities in addition to 
to other new, uh, other new missile threats. So the Missile de Defense Review uh, identified integrated air and missile defense as a major strategic operational concept, right? one that is animated by shift in the, uh, in the security environment, right? in the words of the national defense strategy, one that's more complex and volatile than any we've experienced in recent memory. That complexity and vol volatility consists primarily of two, two major elements. One, the rapid evolution and diffusion of, of advanced military technology, and secondly, the onset or the renewal of sort of great power competition. And it's actually a little bit different from the great competi power competition of the Cold War. We've actually got sort of three, at least three powers, right, that, uh, that are part of this, uh, this, 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 uh, this, this equation. At the same time, the challenges, uh, particularly the missile challenges associated with so rogue regimes and regional, regional, potential regional opponents remains largely um, undiminished, right? So that's kind of the problem set, right? The way the MDR sort of laid this out. Um, so what we've seen over the past couple of uh, years, uh, been, opponents have been rapidly developing military capabilities for high-end conflict. Uh, this has been particularly evident, right, in the domain of, of, of offensive missiles capable of threatening the U.S., its forces abroad, and its allies and, and security partners. And let me just give you, a, you know, sort of a couple of characteristics of this threat environment as we looked at it in, in the MDR. One, we're seeing the steady quantitative expansion and improvements right, in ballistic missiles. They're not going away. They're getting larger and more, more, cha more challenging. We're seeing the development of new systems by big powers like Russia and, and China. Right, new, new, new advanced weapons, hypersonics and advanced cruise missiles. A lot of that, for example, just recently been dis described in the China military uh, power report that the department released uh, within the last couple of uh, days. Additionally, the traditional distinctions between missiles is, is, is collapsing. Right? We're seeing hypersonics that can fly regional or in, intercontinental ranges. We're seeing nations launch ballistic missiles from aircraft. You can take an MRBM, put it on aircraft, you can give it at IRBM ranges. You can take an IRBM, launch it from an aircraft, and give it ICBM ranges. Right? So those distinctions with regard to missiles, kind of regional and strategic, homeland, right, are, starting to, are starting to rapidly collapse. Right? So that's one of the features, right, as we've thought about this, this missile defense and air and missile defense problem we're having to uh, having to uh, cope with. Countries like, uh, you know, Iran and North Korea, right, continue to carry out their, 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 uh, their ballistic missile activity. And lastly, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles are sort of just a feature of contemporary warfare, right? We're seeing the, so the Russians use cruise missiles and ballistic missiles in Syria. We've seen non-state actors like the Houthi rebels in, in Yemen use ballistic and cruise missiles in weirdly in kind of an, you know, in an integrated complex uh, attack structure, right? Threatening and firing missiles, both at Emirati naval vessels and, and American naval vessels uh, over the last, uh, over the last, couple of years. Uh, with regard to right, both regional adversaries along with China and Russia, right, in addition to the technologies and, and, and these new missile capabilities, we're seeing both big powers and the regional powers integrate current and emerging offensive uh, capabilities with their military plans in ways uh, in, in using employment concepts that are generating new vulnerabilities to the U.S. homeland and our forces uh, abroad. Uh, we broadly characterize this, this challenge as one which seeks to deny the U.S. military access, ability to access in key regions and operate within critical areas, right? The so-called anti-access area denial challenge, which uh, I suspect was discussed a little bit uh, earlier today. The strategic aim of A2AD is quite simple, really. It's to overwhelm U.S. and allied combat power at the initial stages of conflict and substantially degrade our will, our decision making, and material ability to respond to aggression or respond to partners and reinforce our partners in, in conflict. The point of all of this, that A2AD is not exclusively missile oriented, but it is missile centric, at least now and for the foreseeable future. There are other elements to it, air defense, counter space, and, and electronic, but, but it's predicated mostly on offensive missile uh, uh, capabilities. And it's directed really at the core of American defense strategy. Uh, namely, you know, the United States as an island power has relied for six to seven decades on its ability to project power at great distance, reinforce its forward deployed uh, forces. And our security institutions and architectures have been built around this, this, uh, this, this principle. And any access or denial is sort of aimed at the heart of American strategy, which is why it's kind of an important element right, uh, to, to, to address. So the MDR identifies a A2AD really as a major strategic operational challenge. Uh, it calls for a strategy to deter and defeat these threats by taking a more holistic approach 
to dealing with these offensive capabilities. It's missile defense or so-called active defense. It's passive defense and it's attack and it's attack uh, attack operations. For the purpose of this discussion, I'll focus a bit more on the active defense uh, uh, dimension. Uh, the MDR highlights a, a, a role for IMD. Uh, now, in past big defense reviews, missile defense reviews, and other types of reviews, and certainly over the past 20 years or so, right, IMD, right, air and missile defense, I mean, how do we think, you know, the, the problem set associated with defending against both ballistic and cruise missiles really has not been a prominent feature of uh, uh, defense plans, right? It hasn't been sort of the focus of, 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 of American strategy. But the MDR does call out a number of key roles, right, for, for integrated air and missile defense, and sort of top level, right? Uh, contribute to, to deterrence of adversary missile attacks or threats by undermining and complicating any access or denial strikes. Protect U.S. and allied forward deployed conventional forces, bases, and associated infrastructure required to prompt, respond promptly to adversary armed aggression and ensure the U.S. ability to blunt, blunt adversary missile strikes in order to maintain our ability to project uh, power into a theater and flow forces in, into a key region to halt or reverse military gains. That is uh, to prevent, right, the, the, the fait accompli. So going forward, there are sort of four areas that the DOD will, will focus on, will require, you know, sustained attention in, in, in kind of adapting its posture to address A2AD. And this applies, I think, both to potentially to the U.S. Joint Force as well as to what we do in our military alliances. The first is sort of IAMD capability, right? I mean, there is, there is a sort of a set of capabilities we're going to need, I think in particular on the cruise missile defense front. I mean, it's an area where there hasn't been, as I said earlier, a lot of focus in the past couple of decades because that isn't where sort of the main threat vectors were uh, coming from. It's essentially, right, the services, and the Army is a, sort of a good example not to pick on them. I think they're doing a good job of actually trying to get back into the AMD and cruise missile defense game. But as you know, right, the Army is buying Iron Dome, two batteries of Iron Dome, right, are attempting to buy two batteries of Iron Dome, right, buying sort of air and cruise missile defenses from a, a foreign government. Part of it sort of reflects the fact that, right, if we're going to rapidly move in that direction, we're going to have to, you know, we're looking at sort of other, uh, other sources. Capacity, right, in the air and missile defense uh, arena, right, this is the question about the right balance between BMD and, 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 and CMD, right? And, and so these are issues the department has, is, is dealing with, looking at sort of force structure sufficiency with regard to regional BMD and cruise missile defense, really in light of an a adversaries who have large sort of missile strike uh, postures. Uh, integration, I, I identified as a third area, and I, I think that came up uh, earlier. I mean, you know, I mean, ensuring that, right, ballistic missile defenses and cruise missile defenses at a technical level are sufficiently synchronized in order to be operationally uh, effective against combined ballistic missile and cruise missile uh, strikes, right? And the Army is actually doing some good work on putting, bringing together the THAAD and the, and the PAC-3 uh, system. And then I think lastly, right, interoperability. Uh, and that uh, within, within kind of the air and missile defense uh, kind of uh, framework. I think it's really critical with allies and, and partners. And I understand I some of that was discussed as as well. I mean, this is really the key to increasing the overall effectiveness of our collective combat uh, capability, right? So it's going to require sort of systems that, that we and our allies have that, that are compatible, are going to have to do, you know, exercise and train, and develop con concepts of operation, right, in key theaters to make sure, right, we can pull together integrated air and missile defenses to deal with complex offensive ballistic missile and cruise missile strikes. And there's some good news out there as well. For some of you may know, uh, NATO actually has an IAMD policy on the books. Uh, you can go to the NATO's website, and there's integrated air and missile defense. And it kind of says all the right things, right? It's a deterrence, it's attack ops, it's passive defense, and it's, it's missile defense. Um, and what's essential now for NATO, is, right, is, is we and our NATO allies, in, in this case, continue now to bring sort of new capabilities to the, to the framework that's, that's in place. So let me, let me stop there. I think the Army's air and missile defense framework that they've published is kind of a good path. I think that the service is kind of thinking, in, you know, in the right way about this problem set, but I think we've got a ways to go to sort of build out these, uh, build out the posture. Thanks. And it, uh, I think it certainly comes out to me that uh, not only is the Army approach heading in the right direction, but it's nested nicely with the missile defense review that, uh, that you just talked to. I'll now turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Kath Hicks. 
Sure, thanks very much, Dick, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. Uh, it's especially nice to be with Pepe. I think Pepe and I first got to work together in 94, 95, and the thing that strikes me most right now is I don't think either of us had reading glasses back then, <laughs> so <laughs> please excuse me while I put mine on. Um, what I thought I would do is reflect first and foremost on um, what we said back in 2016 in the um, Commission on the Future of the Army on missile defense issues and, and where we have come to in the Army's framework. So um, just to reposition you in that time frame, we were one of the first major external uh, big studies, whether on the Army or something else, that was occurring in the aftermath of the invasion of uh, Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. And of course, because we were looking at the Army, that alongside a variety of other major threats that are known to you all, really helped us, I think, in some ways lead turn with helping the Army, I like to think. They, they claim they supported all our recommendations. Um, on some of the big issues that what we now think of as competition, what those were presenting for the Army. And, and nowhere was this more true than on, on missile defense issues. So I want to hit four things we talked about in the, um, the commission report explicitly on missile defense for the Army and then where we are now in terms of the framework and the discussion um, more broadly in the Defense Department. The first um, item we really hit hard was the deficiencies and underinvestment in SHORAD, um, which we all now take for granted, but at the time um, that was something that was being heard from the warfighter in the field most especially in Europe, of course, um, but not a place where the Army was looking eager to invest significant new funds or structure. Um, the second was uh, the deficiencies in structure around Patriot and also in THAAD, that there, that there was a demand signal very high for both and that we, we were not able to meet those. I'll tell you what we said in the commission, what we ended up deciding in the commission report was that the investment requirements for that, we basically couldn't solve for that. And I think that's sort of going to be reflective of where the Army is today. There isn't sort of a conceivable level of cost that can buy our way out of the missile defense um, challenge set at the level of requirement that's, that's being felt in the field. Relatedly, therefore, was the very high op tempo that Patriot in particular uh, was feeling at the time um, and the reality that we didn't have a good solution inside the Army for that except to just keep plugging along um, and try to manage through the tempo challenges. And then finally, we made a special point of pointing out that the um, GMD mission set was exclusively held by the Guard and that we had concerns about, given the centrality of that mission set to the national security enterprise writ large in terms of our um, approach with our triad, that, um, that, and with our, excuse me, with our missile defense, our national missile defense, that um, there ought to be a more thoughtful, thorough way of integrating GMD for uh, a professional uh, uh, course for officers and for enlisted. And we had concerns that um, keeping it entirely in the guard would, would limit that. Um, so where did we get to as of now, including the, what, how it's wrapped up, I think, in this framework? I think you've seen a lot of progress in some of these areas. On Shored, probably most noticeably, of course, you have the goal set out by General Milley for the four battalions by um, the end of 2023. Um, I think that went much slower than we had hoped it would go in the Army, uh, you know, but looking back, here, you know, at least we're making some forward progress. I think the demand signal, again, from the theater is very, very strong on that. And we, were, we are, as of now, from the Army Commission perspective, one of just a number of major studies out there that have highlighted this challenge. I'll also mention I was on the National Commission um, for the National Defense Strategy. We make the same point there on, on shore ad challenges and in particular with regard to Europe. Um, on Patriot, you know, the, the framework does a nice job of pointing out the FMS side of it, which I do think is important uh, to point out that there are other countries that ought to be purchasing these missile defense capabilities as part of the solution set for our own challenges of structure and tempo. Um, but you do still have these tempo challenges, and the framework acknowledges that. Again, I'm not really clear, and maybe it came up in the prior panel, how the Army is intending to deal with that. And that's largely, I think, a result of the bigger challenge that it's very cost imposing on us, the way we are currently thinking about missile defense. And we have this generational challenge of how to shift the cost imposition and the shot, if you will, the return shot um, advantages to the US. 
Um, and then on the GMD issue, um, it's not touched in the framework. I don't know if it was touched previously. I actually just did a search using advanced technology of the 21st century for the word guard in the framework. It does not appear. So um, I'm left to believe we are right back where we started in terms of that continuing to be um, treated as, a, as an issue that the guard can manage in and of itself without any acknowledgement, I don't think, of what challenges that puts to recruiting and retaining uh, the force over time training it, having it capable of executing that mission. So going forward, where does that leave us? Again, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful based on the framework that there is an, at least an acknowledgement of many of the challenges out there, that there's a seriousness nested within the missile defense review to take on um, and take seriously the challenges of missile defense for the Army. Um, I am continue to be worried, as I am in every part of DOD, frankly, it's not unique to this, that we are very incremental in our approach and that we are facing challenges that really are going to require us to be much more transformational. That's a lot more R&D. That's a lot more disruption of current concepts of how we operate. Um, and I think there's an acknowledgement of that, but I'm not seeing a huge amount of forward momentum again here or in many. It's not disproportionately here. It's probably more than anything reflective of the overall position we find ourselves in with regard specifically to Russia and China. I think the um, emphasis on joint responsibility was important to have, obviously, in the report. I think that's something the Army is going to have to, and the Defense Department is going to have to hold the Army accountable for delivering on behalf of the joint force and, of course, in combined environments where it's appropriate to make sure that, that those enabling capabilities are there. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is the durability of this commitment. I think that's something, and any time you're, you're working essentially against the major cultural influence of a service, um, where in this case for the Army, missile defense is not usually the, their first and foremost priority mission that they like to focus on or invest in. It's challenging to make sure that you have a durable solution set, that the investments focused on today will carry forward in the future, um, and that you can count on the next fit up building on rather than retrograding from the fit up you're in. So I think that's where I'm going to be looking coming out of the framework. Thanks. And uh, now to bring a bit of an operational flavor coming in from United States uh, European Command, uh, Woody Woodmansey. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. You know, the, uh, on behalf of you know, the, our new commander, General Walters, you know, uh, thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me. Uh, as most of you know, General Walters just took uh, over as Commander UCOM on 2 May from General Scaparotti. The following day, then he went up to Mons and took over as Supreme Allied Commander Europe. So again, General Walters has two hats, Commander UCOM, SAC Ur, pretty sure they talk routinely amongst themselves. So, uh, but when Tom asked me to speak, we we're on the cusp of that change of command, we weren't sure what was going to take place, and whether, more importantly, whether his vision and mission and priorities would, would be published. And I'm here to tell you that I got it on yesterday, and, and so I can give it to you hot off the press. And then I went to see how, they, how what the AMD 2028 nests with a combatant commander's view, albeit one combatant commander with his joint view of war fighting. Uh, but I'll give you, I have uh, a, a disclaimer. Actually, I'll give you two disclaimers. One is that I don't have a NATO billet. Uh, I have, only, um, I'm in a US billet, but you'll see as I talk, everything that we do supports NATO and NATO ops. And then secondly, I sit in an ops chair I work for the J3, and if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So with me, everything looks like an ops problem, so I'll address everything as an ops problem for us today. So first, uh, General Walter's vision is that UCOM is a combat-ready warfighting theater uni united with our allies, Red NATO, and partners prepared to execute the full range of combined and joint military operations across all domains. He talks of speed and decisive battlefield effects. General Walter, Walters sees his mission as he, he must <clears throat> uh, execute a full range of multi-domain operations in con coordination with allies and partners to support NATO. So you see a theme, allies and partners throughout. And to deter Russia in order to defend the homeland forward. A lot of people forget that we at UCOM are in Europe to defend the homeland forward. Uh, so, but should deterrence fail, UCOM is prepared to fight alongside allies and partners to prevail in any conflict. So his priorities, his top three priorities, boil down to what's relevant here today for us, is that first, he says, constantly improve the warfighting readiness of our joint force. 
Okay, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on what that means. Secondly, strengthen the solidarity and unity with our ally allies and partners. Uh, thirdly, foster a highly motivated team of patriots uh, to promote lethality, agility, and re resiliency. So in a nutshell, what I just outlined broadly for this audience is General Walter's vision, and it's really no his priorities and his, and his mission, and it's no surprise that he emphasizes joint coalition, allies, uh, and partners in defending the homeland forward. So how does the strategy that we heard uh, Chad talk about uh, about an hour ago, how does it fit, how does it map? I think it maps nicely, uh, and I'll comment on, on how it maps nicely and then challenges that they bring up and then additional challenges in the joint fight. So uh, AMD 2020, Eloise 1 and 2 nicely support Commander's UCOM, Commander UCOM's number one priority to improve warfighting readiness and to deter Russia and assist in the defense of Israel. So UCOM has a capacity, I think we talked about that as well as Army's addressing, and in some areas a capability problem that the Army can help close. This goes toward improving UCOM's ability to be ready to deploy, fight, and win in a joint multi-domain high-intensity conflict by defending deployed forces uh, and critical assets within UCOM AOR. The Army views, their Army's views in pursuit of IBCS, I think allowing for best sensor, best shooter aligns nicely with Commander UCOM's thoughts on, uh, in quotes, increasing the speed and quality of our decision making through enhanced C2 and combined situational awareness, end quote. It remains to be seen how and if IBCS can be truly integrated and interoperable completely across the coalition and joint domains. The concept best shooter, best sensor, I believe is spot on. Uh, fielding Thad Patriot, again, Chad went into detail in IBCS and, and uh, IFPIC and all those. I won't redo what he said, but certainly we, we see it as important in filling critical gaps. Uh, integrated air missile defense must create windows of opportunity, allowing for the synchronization of offense and defense. I think you've heard the panel, kind of a theme for that. Uh, uh, Chad brought up that as well as a theme. Again, now going, moving to LOEs two and three. Two, the capacity for multi-domain ops, and three, providing trained and ready forces. Uh, again, nests nicely in Commander Yukon's vision of his highly motivated team of patriots uh, that he talks about. AMD's 2020 future force structure, multi-mission units such as Patriot Thad, Patriot IFPIC, I'm sure at I, uh, I'm sure at an IFPIC fit nicely into Commander Yukon's vision of multi-domain and highly motivated teams. LOE 4, maintaining forward presence. Of course, UCOM being forward present couldn't agree more with the Army's focus on building allied and partner capacity and supports his priority, our commander's priority to accelerate NATO's ongoing adaption, ad adaptation, modernization, and engagements, as well as aligning collective efforts <coughs> at accelerating interoperability. Deterrence, I don't think deploying a piece of equipment here or there across the world uh, is, is, is true deterrence, it's part of it, but really that deterrence is in our commitment to support NATO, to support our allies. So a piece of equipment is just a piece of that. It's our, it's our, our commitment to our allies that is key. So exercises and training activities, most often led by our components within UCOM, uh, support UCOM's priorities to increase the interoperability to build allied and partner capacities. Uh, our our own 10th AAMDC and our Army counterpart, our, our Army, Army component in Europe are instrumental in a lot of these exercises that uh, help our allies and, and work toward that integration. Uh, so, you know, some of the challenges that, that are in the document, you know, challenges about foreign disclosure policy, technical integration among U.S. and allies that we talked in depth about earlier, incorporating allied and partner interoperability requirements and sufficiency that shared commitment that we strive for within NATO. Uh, so some of my own views on challenges that we face in theater uh, in no particular order is passive defense. Uh, I think the, the, the strategy document touches on it, goes into it nicely on, on, on passive defense and what it is, but how is it being incorporated in, in all we do? Are we ready? We play, I think sometimes we pay lip service to passive defense uh, and passive defense. Passive defense starts with a mindset, and, and you've got to ask yourself, are we ready 
uh, uh, we're ready to go there. Interoperability, we talked in, in length about that. I think Chad did a very, very nice job on how he, he, he outlined the three steps for us. Uh, the complexity of the threats. Uh, we have a cruise missile problem in Europe, okay? It's a 360 degree threat as we talked about, uh, but we have to look more broadly other than just army systems, it's important, but there's air force systems, there's navy systems out there. How are we bringing them into the fight? How are we looking at not only point defense, but area defense? How are we looking at fifth gen fighters? How are we looking at navy command and control platforms? Air force, the AOC, the uh, operations center, how are they, how is IBCS plugging into that system? And then lastly, the command and control challenges. You know, what are, is speed, how much speed do we need? What's the right level of automation? And truly, are we integrated? So those are the questions that we ask ourselves in Europe whenever new systems come online, when we're looking at legacy systems, what replacing those legacy systems, how can we better command and control this fight? And I look at everything, again, operationally, not so much at the tactical level, but at the operational level. And I'll close there. Good, thanks, Woody. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not least, uh, Colonel Solis from uh, Jayamdo uh, JA Joint Staff. Uh, thank you, sir, and thanks again to the folks at CSIS for having us here today, and Tom for, again, spearheading a, a conversation on this topic, asking the Army to stick a mirror in front of their face and take a look at their strategy that way, and then asking key stakeholders uh, to take a lens uh, from their own view and, and uh, see how the strategy faces up on, on that measure. Uh, as we led up to this panel, General Formica actually recommended that uh, uh, the lens we look at is the IAMD 2020, and he said that you know you could probably stand up and on behalf of the Joint Staff take credit for leading the Army towards this strategy. Uh, but sir, I think I'm going to defer to 2029 and measure the uh, the successes of the, that uh, strategy at that point. Uh, so on that note, the IAMD Vision 2020 and the AMD, Army AMD Strategy 2028 nest well with each other. Uh, both emphasize the need for a full spectrum of deterrence, active and passive defense. Uh, and offensive defensive integration, a common theme that we've heard uh, from not only Chad's uh, outline earlier today and from the, the fellow panel members today. Uh, as a strategic document versus what uh, the IMD 2020 and aspirational document, uh, the Army is grounded in, in its current efforts and talks about filling the current systems uh, in the pipeline to defend, to defend the maneuver forces and, and critical assets. Uh, and getting that, those, those elements of that strategy right, uh, the manning, the training, uh, the forward presence in there. Uh, again, pulling on the theme about the difference between an aspirational document and a, and a strategic document, uh, I think on a first read, uh, you may look at the IMD Vision 2020 and say that there may be a disconnect between the Army strategy uh, because the, the, the vision statement says we can't afford an active defense solution that meets the enemy missile for missile. And uh, if, if I, I made this mistake on my first read of the Army strategy where I saw all the emphasis on capacity and all the emphasis on on. Uh, uh, on building up our forces. Uh, but then when I sit there and I remind myself where our current forces are, it just was recognized by the, uh, the Commission of, for the Future of the Army that we had allowed a, a huge gap. And I think Chad's comment earlier about bringing observer controllers back to the National Training Center. Uh, I was the last 03 level uh, OC at the National Training Center that did force-on-force -force operations, and I left in 2003. So an enormous gap has formed over that time. Uh, so we can see where the Army is rightfully putting their resources uh, to building towards those, those, uh, those ga or closing those gaps. Chad outlined uh, a couple of risks to the strategy, and he talked about the fiscal risks. I think everybody uh, within the DOD or within the government always wakes up every morning wondering and worrying about uh, their funding streams and making sure that those stay secure uh, when they wake up the next day. And of course, the technological challenges uh, as we face uh, uh, some true splitting the atom type uh, of uh, concepts that we need to get to in directed energy. But I think there's also one hidden risk in there, uh, and really only evident once you start digging deep and deep in there. Uh, and that's one that uh, uh, Chad punted earlier to me uh, as a representative <laughs> joint staff about uh, interoperability. So I'll fully take that on right now and uh, use this as a confessional uh, on there. So in order to achieve all those things that he talked about uh, in integration, uh, and we have to do the, he talked about the interdependence, and then he talked about uh, the interoperability to get to integration. 
One thing that is lying, uh, as in the term I've used before, as an orphan within the Department of Defense, but recognized as an orphan, uh, is the ownership of the operational architecture. Uh, in context, the operational architecture uh, leads you towards developing the systems architecture and subsequently the technical architecture that allows you to get to those, and to use a highly, highly technical term, the beeps and squeaks that uh, will get uh, to that integration uh, that we, we critically need. Uh, but again, the, the department has recognized and as part of some of the efforts that we're doing uh, post-MDR, uh, we're taking a hard look uh, at why that uh, was not uh, carried on at the end of uh, Giamdo's time as a chairman's controlled activity, where the right place for that is, and what's the proper way to resource that effort. Uh, we'll, we won't make up for the two years, uh, plus that that has not been a, uh, an effort uh, led by a, a designated organization in the DOD, uh, but I'm sure that uh, with the right priority and the right authorities, we'll apply a, enough uh, vigor into that to, to make up some of that ground. Uh, and, sir, with that, I'll close my Good, comments Good, thanks. And uh, before I open it up to, uh, to you for your questions, though I promised you that we would do that um, after the panel, um, listening to the panel members at the policy level through operate and down through the operational, I heard a couple of recurring themes. One of them was on capability and capacity. And one of my observations has long been that there's a tension um, as you go down this between balancing investment in new capability and increased capacity of what you currently have. So uh, before I open it up to them, I'm gonna throw this to the panel. What are your thoughts on um, that tension of ca capability and capacity? What needs to be done, not only Army, but across the DOD, and are we doing those things to address that tension? And I'll throw it open to the panel. I'll sure. start, to, oh you can see, no, yeah, no. start, no. Oh, right, okay, thank yeah. you, I'll, I'll defer to the lady. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, I think, a major challenge the department's facing, right? You have, uh, I, I often talk about this as the iron triangle of painful trade-offs. If, if the level of national ambition is roughly where it's been and where it appears to be in the NDS, which is significant, in other words, a significant level of, of desired um, military capability, at the end of the day, you're ultimately in a fixed top line or even not fixed, but, you know, not um, um, endless top line, you're having to trade off readiness, structure, and modernization. It's um, not quite that simple, but it's kind of that simple. There are things that can get you out of that triangle, that geometry. Those things are operational concepts, um, efficiencies, posture, how you position, alliances. So um, there are ways to kind of ease that, but, but fundamentally that's what the department's been grappling with, and it's been grappling with it for decades. Um, and it's, there is no, in my opinion, obvious answer. I think for some um, experts there is an obvious answer, and for those people it tends to be just modernization. But I think the reality um, at the warfighter level is just more challenging than that. Um, I do think fundamentally, as I said in my own remarks with regard to this issue set and more broadly, we have a challenge um, in, in continuing to approach this issue too incrementally. Um, and that pushes us into a almost immediate need to resolve this challenge, whereas you know, thoughtful investment over time and the right research, you know, if, we, if we had known we would need advanced um, you know, short-range air defense systems and had invested in that for years when the challenge presented itself in 2016, we would have had more than a pickup game, you know, those sorts of things. But that's, that's a road of counterfactuals we don't live in. So I do think you fundamentally have to make some investments in, you have to give up some structure in those, so capacity is how people often call it, I prefer to say structure, um, in order to gain um, that modernization advantage, because by the way, that's because I think capability is a combination of all three things I've already talked about. It's not separate from um, structure and it's not separate from readiness. Um, but you have to invest in the modernization. You have to find the money. And I actually think we can make this a less hard trade-off because, it, well, in, outside of the department. The department is largely constrained politically from making these really hard trade-offs. It's, it's also internally constrained culturally, as I mentioned. So this takes uh, tough leadership, uh, central leadership, civilian leadership. Um, for the department to get there, and that's inside the Department of Defense, it's inside the White House, and it's on Capitol Hill, and we're not seeing that right now. Thanks. Sir, so I was gonna say, I think, I think we know what capacity buys us in terms of uh, the 
the results of our, of our capabilities there. The, the, our next best dollars are best placed in capability development and looking for innovative solutions both on the sensing side of the house so that we can make our uh, offensive fires more effective uh, as well as uh, on, uh, on the active defense non-kinetic solutions uh, that will help prevent launches uh, in that arena. But if we had, uh, if we had put uh, our dollars on the table, I think capability development in those areas would be our, our, our choice. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, just a, a brief observation. I mean, uh, the, the tension between capability and capacity you described, I mean, actually, it's just, it's an ongoing reality. It actually never goes away. I would argue it plays uh, an important role in the department because it forces, right, the different uh, approaches in, in DOD, right? I mean, the capability, capacity, I don't want to say pits different organizations, but, you know, the, the combatant commanders, the warfighters sort, sort of think of the fight tonight, right? And they're, they're interested in capacity, 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 as they should be. Others, maybe on the civilian side or on the R&D side, are thinking about, well, how do you, that, that's, we understand that, but, you know, you've got to also lay in the foundation for future threats, right, that are, that are developing. It, in part, it's strategy driven. Right? I mean, at least as a policy guy, I always like to think the policy and strategy drive these things. The reality in the building is it's a little bit messier. Um, but certainly one has to look at, there's been a fairly static period of 20 years here, post-Cold War, right? In which the capability capacity challenge as it re related to major conflict and high intensity uh, conflict, right? Wasn't a challenge within, within the, the department, right? The international security circumstances have changed, right? I mean, you know, as I mentioned earlier, rapid military uh, advancements, the diffusion of those capabilities, and new major geopolitical challenges is going to force the department, and I agree with Kath here, that, I mean, is going to force the department to, to the leadership to engage on how it prioritizes sort of these competing resources, because it's just sort of not an infinite set of uh, resources to fund capacity and, and capability. And uh, maybe to, to, to Mike's point, in an era of rapid uh, geopolitical change and rapid military technological change, I think the scale, in my view, sh should tip more in the, in the innovative capability direction, right? Because we're gonna have to think differently about the problem set we're dealing with today, because it's different from the problem set we dealt with five years ago, 10 years ago, and 15, 15 years ago. Good, thanks. Anybody, uh, what do you wanna talk to yeah, I'll just shortly say, you know, it, operationally at the combatant command, you know, capacity, you never have enough. You know, we're always, we're always arguing with the, with, the, with the joint staff on give us more, give us more. Paycom's asking for the same thing. So, you know, uh, but we do, like, like Kath said, you know, alliances, you know, it, we, used to, uh, we used the term with NATO burden sharing, and I've always disliked that word because uh, collective defense shouldn't be a burden. It should be a shared commitment, right? So it should, uh, so what, what is the shared commitment? What's the right balance? for U.S., NATO, how are we, how we work in that shared commitment uh, to give us the right capability, capacity for uh, defense in Europe. Uh, again, you know, and then how long do we defend before we make the decision to, to go offense? Can't play catch forever, so there's gotta be a balance between offense and defense. Yeah, and I hope that offense, defense integration uh, will get, that thread will get pulled through your questions, but if not, I'll, I'll come back to it. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to highlight, um, I heard through your discussions, and uh, Colonel Skaggs uh, talked to it, the whole reason of uh, 2020, AMD 2028, was this gap that we have in a SHORAD capability in the Army. And uh, I think it's important to remember, I've, he I've heard senior leaders say there was a strategy gap and we let AMD SHORAD particularly atrophy. And I would offer there wasn't a strategy gap. There was a very distinct strategy. Um, the same five threats, terrorism, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, were identified. The priority and what we attributed to that threat was different. And as an army looks at, Kath talked about ma uh, balancing modernization, force structure, and readiness, um, as the army looks at or any service, what kind of capability do you need and what capacity are you gonna build? Starts with the strategy. What do you want the Army to do? What capabilities do you need it to have? And then to build a force and then you answer the question, can you organize, man, equip, train, fund, and station it? And I believe that process took place over the last 20 years 
and the Army responded to the strategy, the capability that was expected of it for the fight that it was in. And, uh, and now, with a new priority, a new assertion of threat for near-peer competitor, you have a different set of capabilities that's required, and I think that's where we find ourselves. So with that, I'd like to open the floor over here in the back, young lady. There you go. Uh, hi, Jessica Bland from the British Embassy. Firstly, I want to thank um, everyone today for their comments on the importance of allies and partners um, with regards to missile defense, and particularly the statement around how having forward deployed forces is actually a protection for the US homeland. My question kind of comes in two parts. Firstly, do you believe, it's a NATO-focused question, no surprise, um, do you think NATO is responding appropriately within the IAMD forum uh, or even partner countries just within Europe with regards to the INF violating missile that Russia has deployed? And secondly, how do you balance any change in that posture with the need to reassure that we are not affecting their strategic capability through the NATO BMD construct, which is focused on Iran. Anybody? I'll take the second part because, like I said earlier, I don't do policy. Okay, <laughs> so that's the hard things for Pepe. But, but I will say, you know, we, I think sometimes we let the Russian rhetoric get, get to us because those systems are all defensive systems and they're all, and we've said it over and over again, they're aligned toward, they're not aligned toward, toward Russia and, and they don't have the capability for Russia. So uh, we've, we've said it over and over again, but we allow that rhetoric to get to us. Yet NATO BMD, uh, I think it's one of the, uh, the, the wins for the alliance. It shows a, uh, again, not burden sharing, but shared commitment amongst the alliance members. And I, uh, I don't think whatsoever it is, it is, is poking Russia uh, one bit. I'll leave the first question to someone else. You know, on the, you know, how is NATO responding to, right, sort of the IAMD uh, challenge? I think both for the United States and its NATO European allies, right, we sort of left IAMD kind of in the distant past, right? I mean, it, it was an uh, artifact of the Cold War, and we've, had, and we've spent 20 plus years not focused on those kinds of capabilities and and concepts. So we're, in a way, I'd say kind of the United States and NATO are sort of in the same place, right? I mean, as I said, we identified, right, integrated air and missile defense as an important strategic operational concept to help us deal with new anti-access area denial challenges posed by the, the big powers. So we've reintroduced the, the, the concept and, right, the department has spent, uh, DOD has spent a good bit of time in the past six to nine to 12 months sort of consulting with allies, lots of engagements in Europe and in capitals, right, to really rebuild the consensus on the role of integrated air and missile defense. And that's taken a while. I mean, that's what the alliance is about. There are lots of consultations to help them understand, look, this is, what potential big power adversaries are, are doing, right? I mean, they're integrating their, their cruise missile and their ballistic missile strikes in ways, right? It's not, it's not a technical problem. I mean, they're, they're trying to prevent, right, the alliance from upholding its kind of deterrence and defense functions. And so, so um, you know, the short answer is, yeah, I think the allies are starting to respond, at, but it's, you know, there's work in the policy levels in NATO, and you've got NATO military committees. Uh, I will tell you that both the, Paul Mill committees and the military committees in NATO are looking at questions related to integrated air and missile defense right now and developing positions and, uh, and sort of strategies and, and, and you know, trying to figure out kind of the, the way ahead with the United States, right, intimately involved in, in that regard. As it relates to, you know, Russian INF, I mean, what the Russians are doing with, the, you know, this long range, land-based long range cruise missile is actually uh, emblematic of the larger threat, right, that's been in place for a, for a while, right, with new Russian cruise missile capabilities. It simply reinforces the importance of the alliance, right, rethinking, right, defense of its own, right, critical uh, assets. Great, thanks. Anybody else? Brian. Right up here in front. Uh, Brian Dunn, Lockheed Martin. So I really appreciate the dialogue up here. I especially liked the discussion about trying to achieve balance between 
left of launch, deep strike operations, and, and the defensive operations. So from, a, from a, a DOD standpoint, it appears now that the department at least has taken the position that the focus of resources and priority is going to be to left of launch. There's a tremendous amount of investment and resources that are being applied to hypersonic strike. Uh, very, very uh, inversely uh, on the hypersonic defense side. So from a crystal ball standpoint, at what point or what is the inflection point that we see that at, at some point the de uh, hypersonic defense begins to be better resourced than what it is today? So at this point, uh, the department's still looking at its options for the defense of hypersonics. Uh, so I think timeline-wise, maybe a year or so, uh, once those tough investment decisions are, are made. Uh, and when we're talking about hypersonics, they are tough investment uh, decisions. It's a very challenging threat set uh, that will require uh, new technologies and new, uh, new movements into different parts of, uh, of the, the the domains that we haven't been in before. Uh, and rightfully so, I think we're taking a very deliberate approach to it, and uh, the threat at this time and the pacing of it allows us to, to, to take that uh, deliberate approach, and uh, I think it's wise for us to, to go that way. Anybody else? I, I think it is safe to say that hypersonics as a capability is something that we would be prudent to look at both from a defensive capability and how do we defend against it, and I think it's important that we do that. And then how might we uh, employ that offensive capability? The only other thing, I, one thing on the term left of launch, and I know it's a term of art, and we, we use it fairly frequently. I just hate for the term left of launch for anyone to imply that we were going to attack them before they were able to attack us. And I think attack ops or offense defense integrations, as you know, Brian, much more nuanced than just left of launch. We're never going to be able to do it all with a, an attack op prior to launch. It's gonna be across the continuum of operations and it may be retaliatory, um, but it's not necessarily always gonna be, it may be left of that guy's launch, but it's also taken out other systems, the, the full range of systems from logistics to command and control um, that's a part of offense defense integration beyond just um, a narrow left of launch. Sydney. Hi, that is a great segue you wasn't asked. Um, How did I know? <laughs> uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, I'm very struck uh, by Dr. Hicks' comment that we, you know, we are doing this incrementally and you know, hearing that NATO is having meetings is not the most reassuring thing on that front. Uh, that uh, you know, we need something radical. So what, I mean, what is that? I, I'm called, the Battle of Thermopylae comes to mind where the Persians say, you know, we're gonna fire so many arrows uh, the sky will turn black, and the Spartan, you know, sergeant replies, well, then we'll fight in the shade. <laughs> I mean, do we just need, there's so, the volume of this threat, especially from China, but also from Russia, is so great, and you know, the customization is so bad, that is there a way to turn that around, be it by, you know, develop, you know, putting lasers on everything, or uh, some EW cyber approach, or you know some preemptive or uh, you know left of launch to pardon the term approach, or do we just need to learn how to fight in the shade? And, you know everybody dig in and hide and, and pray that they're alive. Uh, you know in the, after, after when the Russians run out. Well, I'll, I'll say at a broad level, and I, I I'll defer down the row here uh, for sure. Um, you know, my flippant answer is it's probably a little bit of all those things, minus the lasers on everything, because I, I picture Roombas with lasers <laughs> when you say that, which is probably unwise. Um, so I think it's a combination. I think first and foremost, it's about operational concepts, flat out. And there you can see the Army doing some good work, for sure. For example, obviously in Europe, but also in the Pacific as part of a joint um, force trying to think through these challenge sets as they present themselves now. A question for the entire joint force and for the department is, are, which I cannot answer here today, is are we doing this at the scale and speed and seriousness and ability to bridge to adaptation of what we find? Are we doing that experimentation as we should be? I am suspicious that we are not, 
I welcome being told that we are being proven wrong about that. But I think it starts there, and then that leads you to the technology piece. Whether the tech, you know, what, what begins and what follows, I think, is always uh, unique and not always one way or the other. But by and large, I think the concepts have to be worked out with the technology before we know what exactly we want to invest in. Um, and I also suspect it's about a range of bets. And those bets are probably as much in the R&D realm, or even more in the R&D realm, than they are in the immediate, for the reasons I just said, procurement realm. Um, I do think the allies piece becomes very important because of where we're talking about. I think the posture, so dispersal, et cetera, whether you think of that more in the operational concept realm or really just in terms of how you're thinking about global posture, um, you know, we, we just have to be very thoughtful about that. At the same time, we're kind of thinking through the, the reality of the shot doctrine problems that we're facing. Um, so I do think some steady investment in the incremental side is important. It still matters. It signals for sure to adversaries and to allies and partners, and it has real capability. But it has diminishing returns as the technology advances. So the question is, how do we make sure we pace that and get in front of that? And I'm not, again, convinced that we're there. Uh, I'll, Woody? I'll take, <clears throat> yeah, fight in the shade. You know, I, I think you know, we, and I say we, Europeans, US, NATO, have to be ready to fight in a complex environment, and, and we are. Okay. The, the second thing is we've got to be ready to defend what matters. Okay. And, and thirdly, uh, again, it goes back to the commitment. And when you talk about the NATO capabilities writ large, we in this room tend to think about what we just heard about in the last few hours. But when you broaden that up to what the U.S. Navy brings, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Marines, and then you open it up to our allies and partners through Europe, it's an incredible capability that we have in Europe. And we don't get to see that enough sitting here in the U.S. and looking at U.S. capabilities. But when you go out and you see these exercises and you see the NATO forces, how capable they are in fighting, fighting during exercises side by side with us, it's, it's really nice to see. And they, when we talk about homeland defense, we always think about our homeland, right? But guess what? When we're over in Europe, it's their homeland. And so they're as committed to defending their homeland as we are to, commit, uh, to defending our homeland. Yeah, I think, look, the, there's, no, there's no silver, silver bullets in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this sort of pro problem set, right? I mean, it's, you know, as Kat said, I mean, it's kind of all of the above. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just the things we're, we've focused on here, sort of active defense and the passive defense piece and the attack operations. It's the other important role that you know, general purpose forces play in a particular theater. When you combine right. them with those other capabilities, I mean, you end up with a much broader tool set that is intended to first and foremost deter right, pr provocative actions at the lowest level possible, right? And if the, that fails to ensure, right, you've got the right set of offensive and defensive and passive defense capabilities to accomplish the mission, whatever that may be, whether it's in Europe or, or with, you know, in the Indo-PACOM area. But, and we, Fair point, right? That the offensive missile threat really is, you know, continues to grow and present an incredible challenge, right? To, to right to overall defense posture. I think the other piece gets back to the sort of the way we're thinking about advanced technologies again, right? I mean, the Department of Defense during the post Cold War era, right, wasn't investing a lot in those areas because there wasn't sort of a, a strategy or threat driver, right, compelling, right, us to think differently about new capabilities or innovative concepts of operation, right? And the calculus has changed now, and, and you can see in some areas, even in, in sort of the narrow area of missile defense, right, the exploration of new and advanced uh, capabilities to help provide more um, sort of cost-effective sort of future solutions, right? We're really in that process, but we're looking at those kinds of capabilities in a whole host of different domains, mm -hmm. right? Most of which are sort of unable, you know, kind of unable to right, be addressed in, in some, some uh, public ways. So I'd say yes to all that, and then I'd add two thoughts. Um, first, um, when the Army was looking at this problem, it didn't look at it just from the standpoint of air and missile defense. And if you look across its six modernization priorities, from long-range precision fires to the network to AMD, 
uh, and all in between, they looked at it holistically and what are the kinds of capabilities we're going to need um, to fight in a new environment and to bring that as, as Kath said, um, what are the concepts, multi-domain ops, to provide that conceptual framework in which you would apply those capabilities. And then, not to oversimplify this, but one of the reasons that I continue to talk about offense, defense integration, more than just attack ops, is my experience over the time of my career, when we were in the middle of a Cold War, we were always gonna face a Soviet artillery threat that had much more capacity than our capability to do what I would call the counter battery fire. He shoots, we pick it up, we shoot back. So we looked at counter fire much more broadly and it started with first rapid offensive maneuver because if you were pushing him back, he wasn't shooting and if you could get him out of range, you could mitigate the threat. Two, you take out his eyes and we apply passive defense as a part of that, reducing the, the capability of his eyes. Three, proactive deep strikes. Go find his capabilities, not just the launcher, but the full range of capabilities, and take them out. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. And then finally, it was counter battery, and the equivalent here would be the active defense. So yes, there's always going to be a need for more capacity than we have, but there's other ways to get at it. It's not just active defense. So it's not, we don't have to just fight in the shade. We want to move the sun. Um, next question. Here. Okay, my name is Sang Min Nam, a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. Uh, last Saturday, North Korea launched a projectile which included a short range ballistic missile. So, I want to know what is your response to this um, the launch when it comes to the uh, missile defense. And, second question is considering this North Korean missile test, how do you see the uh, United States uh, dep the mass uh, missile defense capability because nowadays the United States deployed a Patriot missile defense battery and uh, start in South Korea. So how to see how to assessment this capability to deter a North Korean missile threat? Then we want to take that. Uh, Chad answered that question in the earlier mm -hmm. uh, comment. And again, the, the same comment that we'll deploy a full range of capabilities and we'll constantly look at what's the threat what kind of capabilities do we need and to be able to deploy capabilities to be able to address that threat. So I think we've, I think we've a, a, a taken that first question. And the second question, does anybody want to talk about that capability in Europe? I mean, in, uh, oh, in, in South Korea? Sorry. What was that? The capability, how, our assessment of THAAD's capability in uh, South Korea. Well, that, so the deployment of THAAD to, to ROK, to, to, to be clear, is focused really on right, strengthening the protection of U.S. and Korean forces as it relates to sort of longer, some of the longer range regional ballistic missiles from North Korea. Um, but I don't know, I, I don't have anything to offer yeah. beyond that, right? I mean, it's intended to provide, along with the Patriot systems, uh, more effective layered defense. So that, that's what THAAD brings, right? It, it reaches out further, provides wider area protection protection in, in conjunction with the Patriot now. It will provide a more effective defense and will provide greater uh, sort of area area coverage, right, against uh, potential North Korean missile launches into, into South Korea. And, and it's an important capability and, it, and that's a good location to have that capability. You had a question here, sir? And then, did you? Yeah, coming to you next. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dong Hyun Kim from Voice of America Korean Service. Uh, uh, regarding, I'm, I'm, I want to ask about the uh, ally com uh, commitment for the, uh, what you mentioned about the commitment to defend the ally. Uh, after it's related with the missile uh, last week, after North Korea fired the short range ballistic missile, there was a comment by Ma Mr. Mike P Pompeo that it's not something to fuss about since it's not a long range or middle range ballistic missile. And what the ally side perceive is, oh, since it's not a threat to the United States directly, it's, not, it's nothing to fuss about. And so like some, some, some misunderstanding can happen with this thing, like is US government just focusing on mainly on homeland security, uh, like 
for mid or longer ballistic missile than shorter ballistic missile. And I just wanted to ask. Uh, as the non-U.S. government employee, I'll be happy to answer that on behalf yeah, of I've got an answer, too. I've got an answer, too. Um, uh, yeah, those sorts of statements are extremely problematic. Um, our commitment to extended deterrence, <coughs> the uh, commitment we have more generally, our treaty commitment to, in this case, the Republic of Korea and Japan, that that missile test clearly aimed to threaten and divide us from. Um, warranted a response that signaled more than anything unity um, and um, strength of alliance. And um, that is not the message that was sent. Um, so we have to make sure we do better, that our public messaging and our private messaging all work to confirm that our best position with regard to North Korea is if we are positioned together. That means, of course, that The Rock and Japan have to have a strong relationship, but also, of course, that we as the United States um, are firm in uh, our statements of commitment and our, and our uh, expressions of commitment. That would mean things like exercises that are currently suspended, things of that sort. Um, so yeah, I think it's a very troubling path in particular because it's clear that that is the North Korean tactic of choice, which is to demonstrate a division between the United States and its, um, its allies. And that is clearly resonating when the U.S. reinforces that, whether by accident, misstatement, or worse. So let me provide a slightly different kind of look at this. Um, I mean, the U.S. has the has a substantial commitment of military capabilities in South Korea today, 28,000 troops, right? That hasn't, that hasn't changed. It's made substantial commitments to missile defense in South Korea with Patriots and THAAD and, and BMD-capable Aegis ships in, in the region. So, you know, you can go to State Department for clarification on what Secretary of State said, but in terms of the U.S. commitment of missile defense capabilities to South Korea, that not only remains unchanged, but I've, over the past couple of years, right, with the additional deployment of that, that commitment of missile defense capabilities in South Korea has, has increased. So I think that is a tangible element of sort of U.S. commitment to ensure it continues to uphold its security obligations in that, in, 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 on the peninsula. Great, thanks. Sir. Sure, sure Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Um, I just want to throw this out as a general question because it kind of picked up on Cass' comments about the incremental approaches and the transformational approach. And when you think about the threat broadly over the next five to ten years, um, is it fairly linear? Are there major breakpoints that we're going to worry about? We mentioned hypersonics as one. The whole swarming UAV problem is really fascinating. If you look at what's going on in the commercial UAV delivery projects, the, the proliferation of that technology globally. So. I'm just, if you can characterize how you think about this threat over the next five to 10 years, that'd be helpful. Anybody? Um, I'll, I'll speak to it broadly and, and beyond the missile defense realm, if you will. I mean, I think, I think space, of the things you didn't mention, because I agree with the ones you already mentioned, I think space and cyber are top my list. Um, and inside cyber, I would combine, there's, there's various forms of that, but certainly the information domain and, and the ability to shape information, so deep fake, with, when you get cyber with AI, um, the ability to really change narrative and change beyond narrative what the warfighter sees and thinks is happening in his or her operating environment, um, that's extremely worrisome to me. The space piece probably tells itself, but I think we're, we have seen a tremendous aggressiveness from the Chinese and the Russians in space. I'm very pleased to see how much of that is now unclassified and widely available. I think space is one of those places where we held so much um, internally for so long that uh, the rest of society is, including on the Hill, they're playing, trying to play catch up to a challenge set that is really evident, I think, in the defense community. Um, so we're seeing some of that play out, of course, through Space Force, but more generally, I think, the ability to talk about the nature of the space threat, especially from Russia and China, um, ha is something that can help us move forward. Um, I think with the United, I just want to say I think the United States has some strong advantages. Um, that we've talked about some of them like alliances that are more at the strategic level um, and extremely important. I would say at the operational level, um, beyond all the things that we should focus on first in terms of our personnel and our training, I think our undersea capabilities 
um, though they are challenged, and some of the things we've already talked about are part of that challenge. I think that's an area of strength for the United States to be building on. Um, and um, you know, I think our advanced air capability and our, in our information and sensor capability is, um, our, our, our potential for warning, for global warning, is much higher. We have some work to do, particularly because we focus on um, warning for when things turn red and the strategy of choice from Russia and China, among others right now, is to never let the indicators go red. So we have a lot of work to do in our intelligence system to catch up to that competition element, the gray zone element. But I think it's well within our, it's well within us. And then our soft power, I'd, I'd put up there with the allies. Um, we need to be underscoring and building up our soft power. Uh, General Formica reminded us earlier, and, and it was a really key point there, sir, that we were executing a strategy, and the strategy was focused in a different area. As we pivot, and I hate to use that term pivot, but as we, as we refocus the great power competition, uh, it calls for a reassessment of our current capabilities against that new adversarial or competitor threat that we're looking at. Uh, make a, an assessment and an incremental approach, in the, at least initially, is again the, probably the right way to go when you're, when you're in a resource constrained environment. Uh, there isn't going to be a, a, a lottery ticket that we can scratch off and, and pay for a lot of these things. So, incremental at this point, I think, is a prudent way of, of uh, refocusing our, uh, our capability development and capacity building. I'd like to give the panel a chance. Any closing thought that you might want to share as you sign off? Sir, the, the only thing I would say is that uh, going back to the, the theme of today's uh, panel about the Army uh, strategy, uh, we at the Joint Staff level are pleased to see uh, the direction that the Army's taking it. We, we cheer them on as they build that uh, short range capacity that uh, will enable us to, to really close start doing some gap closing uh, with some of our uh, competitors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Woody? There isn't one thing that it, we're going to do that's going to make this all go away. So again, incremental, it's going to be across all domains. It's going to take, it's that shared commitment. It's with our allies, lockstep with our allies every step of the way. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, I would just reinforce the durability of the commitments really important. So whether we're talking about the Army or the Department, the degree to which it's really invested in these areas um, with regard to missile defense will prove out over time. Um, and so that's what I think we should be watching. Just two aspects of this. One is that the Army's put together, I think, a good template. I'd like to see, actually, the, the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, I'm getting in trouble when I get back into the building. I, uh, <laughs> put together something similar, but, but in a way that starts to reflect the, the importance of the, the services working in a, in a more collaborative fashion, and I think that's an area that needs more attention. And then secondly, just to reinforce how important it is to extend this concept the way we think about working in air and missile, integrated air and missile defense. We've got to be able to do this, extend this approach with our allies and our security partners because they're the sort of force multiplication component, right, in, uh, in our defense strategy. So isn't being in trouble in the building part of the normal state of play? I mean, so <laughs> I appreciate, you taking, I appreciate yeah. you taking that risk. So we're at the end of our time. I want to thank a couple of people to close this out. First and foremost, thanks to you here in the audience and those online. Uh, for your uh, attention, for your participation, and for your thoughtful questions. I'd like to thank the panel for preparing for this, for, again, for being thoughtful in not only your opening comments, uh, but in your responses to these questions. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tom Carrico, Kath Hicks, and the CSIS and the Missile Defense Project for investing in this discussion, for hosting it, uh, and for moving our discussion on air and missile defense forward. And then finally, in every public forum that I have, when we talk about air and missile defense, we spent a lot of time talking today about policy and about some acquisition and capability and capacity. Um, but I would like us to close by remembering that behind all this, there are soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and civilians who will develop, deploy, and operate the systems that we're talking about. And it is to them that we owe a sincere debt of gratitude. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you all very much. Thank you.